So everything I'm going to show you uh, in the first part of this, as I run through it, <clears throat> you can find and execute for yourself um, from this GitHub repository right here. This is in my personal GitHub space. I have several tutorials uh, that I've worked up and a few more that are coming. This one right here that I have pinned to the top right is uh, an installation for a single node cluster. Now, what I'm going to show you guys here is going to be running on a NUC, an Intel NUC um, 8i3 BEK. It's got 32 gigabytes of RAM in it. It's got a uh, one terabyte uh, SSD uh, M2 drive in it. And it's a dual core, uh, which means four vCPUs. So, so this little guy right here is not a high-powered piece of equipment by any means. Uh, and they're actually pretty affordable. This one is getting, <clears throat> as computing goes, it's getting a little long in the tooth. Uh, the newer uh, i3 FNK will actually uh, allow you to put 64 gigabytes of RAM in it uh, has faster CPUs and and if you really want to spend a, a little bit more the, the i7 uh, and I should have brought one of them down here so I could hold it up to the camera if I had been thinking about it because they truly are tiny little machines that, that you can do a ton with so when you get to this point here um, you can either navigate uh, into the documentation through the readmes or I do have it up on github pages so this right here, and the link is hanging off of Mike McKean's site where he's hosting the documentation for us, but I will also uh, post it in our chat right here, right now. Oh, there we go. Okay, here, Bruce here's your duck, uh, child. Yeah, there you go. Bruce is holding one up for you if you can see it on the uh, on the image there. They are, they're tiny little things, and... Um, I'm ashamed to admit it, and it's probably embarrassing to my wife, but I actually travel with four of those when we go on vacation because I like to take my OpenShift cluster with me because it keeps me happy. So without further ado, let's deploy a single node OpenShift cluster. I'm going to move this link back over here out of the way. I'm going to minimize this browser because we won't need it for a while. We are going to be working from the command line for a bit. Okay, so if you if you look at the GitHub pages, the first section is installing and setting up your host. Now, in in my lab, uh, I'm actually running a, a a Pixie environment with with iPixie that I boot and install my machines from. So I'm skipping that point for you. I have a, a brand new installation of uh, this particular one is CentOS 8, uh, but this uh, tutorial should work uh, almost out of the box without modification for CentOS Stream or if you're running Fedora. It does need to be an RPM based if you're if you're following this tutorial because I make some assumptions about the, the commands that are available for managing the machine. So the first thing I'm going to do is install my vert uh, environment. And you'll see this is not going to do anything because my Pixie boot already knew that this was going to be a KVM host. So it did that for me. So the next thing I'm going to do is install all of the tooling that we're going to need for this lab. So I'm going to install wget. Uh, I'm going to install git because we've got to get the code from somewhere. I'm installing the net tools because I'm still kind of an old fashioned Unix sysadmin and I just can't let go of if config and net stat. Um, so net tools provides that crutch for me. We're going to stand up a DNS server. So I'm installing bind and bind utils. Uh, I'm installing bash completion because Cheryl. I'm installing rsync, um, the guest FS tools, because we are running libvert and KVM here. Cheryl. I'm installing vert yeah, install. Bigger font cart, Cheryl. Cheryl. Yeah, Cheryl, oh, time okay. out. Let, let me, me way crank too small. that up just a bit. How's that, Bruce? 
three times bigger. Bigger. Is that readable? No. That's Not good. Yet. I think. Is it good? Bigger? Okay. Then? Okay. It, it's it's yeah. going to take a minute to read one more. Yeah, because Charo can't probably see the. Uh, you can't see the chat, right? Mm -mm. No, I can't. Not um, not while I'm in this in this form here. Yeah. So the bigger there the bigger. Go. How's that? Eric, give me a thumbs up if that's good. Okay, I'd say uh, Eric says bigger. Still bigger. Oh, because you guys aren't seeing it full screen in. The... No, no, we just get a part. We've got the talking heads below here. Yeah, they've got seventy-five percent of what is interesting. Reading. Okay, I wonder is there a way for us to? I don't see a okay. quick way you um, for us to make yeah. it here. Yeah, yeah, now now they say it's readable. Okay. okay. It takes a minute to refresh. I think we. Can, let's see if I can hide the video. No. You could take your faces off and that might hide the video. Did that hide me or did it just leave a box where I used to be? I think it left a box where you used to be. Yeah. yeah. You might, might as well keep your faces there. on. I would still go All right. one more font size bigger if you could. Um, sure. Oh, yeah, I can. I, I can crank this. Tell you what I will do. I'm going to make this terminal. I'll leave some of the terminals a little smaller because they're just going to be scrolling logs. But the one that we work in, I'll do this. So hopefully you guys can see it. Um, give me a thumbs up if this is good, folks. Yes. All yep. right. Thanks. Good. We got there. All right. Thanks, guys. All right. Okay, so um, we're involving, installing the EPEL release because we're going to need some of the libraries from there. Um, Libvirt development, uh, the HTTPD tools that are going to give us um, some of the things that my, some of the tooling that my scripts use. And finally, Nginx. And all Nginx is going to do here is host the ignition configs for a newly booted machine to grab its ignition from. So I'm going to go ahead and let those install. All right. And I'm going to make sure that libvirt is running and enabled. And now what I'm going to do is, because I just like to control things, I'm going to tell libvirt where to... Uh, store its virtual machines when I create them. So I'm creating, uh, I'm deleting the default pool if it exists. Now you can see here in this case, uh, there was no default pool. Uh, and then I'm going to create uh, this default pool and I'm going to point it at slash virtual machines. So all of the uh, VMs that I build with libvirt, they're going to go into that location. Now I'm going to uh, start up Nginx because we're going to need it. And I'm going to create the directory under uh, Nginx's default serving directory where we're going to host our ignition config files. And finally, I'm going to configure the firewall. All right, so I'm enabling HTTP and HTTPS from the firewall. I'm en enabling DNS because we are running bind and the rest of the firewall I will leave in place. Next step is we're gonna need an SSH key so we can get to our OpenShift cluster if we need to directly connect to any of the nodes. So I'm gonna create myself an ED25519 key pair. The next part of the tutorial here, I'm not going to actually execute. I'll put it on the screen here for just a minute so that you guys can see it. This is creating the network bridge. And what I've included for you here uh, is the command line way uh, using NMCLI to create your network bridge. Now, there are, there are graphical ways to do this as well. You can even do it during the install if you want. Um, the network bridge was actually already created for this environment. Um, you can see here, this is my bridge, BR0. It was created by the, by the Pixie boot. 
So the, the networking was already configured for me um, when this host was installed just a little bit ago. But I did include in the tutorial um, everything you need to set up bridged networking uh, on your own. And so with that out of the way, we're going to let this guy apply any updates and then reboot. So this will take just a little bit. And while this is doing uh, its thing, getting the operating system all fresh and ready to go, I'll bring this back over here for you guys. And I'll take you on a, a little bit of walkthrough of, of what we're going to do next. So the next thing we're going to do is we're going to clone the Git repository where this tutorial resides. And um, I've, I've already provided several utility scripts that are going to make the, the work that you're going to do here um, much smoother. I'll take you through what the scripts do. Uh, in case there's anything you want to customize or you want to take apart and, and reuse for something else, uh, there are several environment variables that you're going to set that uh, I've provided an out of the box in, in the set SNCENV script, uh, but you will probably want to modify them for your own environment. The 10.11.11.0 uh, is what I'm currently using in my home lab network. So we'll set a, a domain that will be um, our DNS domain for this lab. Um, this SNC host is going to be this um, server that is rebooting right now. The name server actually is going to be the same one, but I've allowed by using variables uh, for you to use different hosts. So you can create your own name server host if you want to. You can have your own bastion server. You can run the single node cluster uh, on its own machine. So by, by varying these variables, you'll control how and where things are installed in your uh, single node cluster. And while I'm at it and we're waiting for that little guy to come up, I'll also say um, when you graduate from the single node cluster but want to use the same type of environment, I have a similar tutorial that will take you through building a full productionized six node cluster with three master nodes and three worker nodes. All right, our host is back up and it has a new fresh updated install. So let's go ahead and continue with our single node cluster build. So the next thing I'm gonna do is create a place for all of this code to live, all right. And I'm going to clone my repository. Okay. So I've got a clone now of the repo that I've been showing you guys. Um, all right. So my bin directory already exists because my pixie boot actually created that. So I'm going to copy all of the utility scripts from the bin directory that are in um, this repository into my um, users. And right now I'm running as, as root, um, my users home directory. And then I'm going to make it executable. So here's what we just copied over. All right. There's a, um, there's a utility script to deploy our single node cluster. There's a utility script that is going to yank the bootstrap node out when the bootstrap is completed, just leaving our single node uh, running. There's a um, script for setting up the environment that will just set all of the environment variables for us. That's what I was just showing you uh, over on the other screen. And as you can see, 
uh, it does have um, entries that are biased toward this particular setup. And in fact, I believe they're biased toward this particular machine in my lab. Uh, indeed, you can see that um, I'm on 10.11.11.206. So, so this, this script conveniently was already set up to run on this particular machine. Uh, the last couple of things is there is a script to set up the DNS for you, and there is a script to destroy your single node cluster. Um, the undeploy SNC will, will completely remove your single node cluster. And when you rerun the setup DNS, that will actually put your environment back to a point that you can redeploy the cluster. So you can also clean this whole thing up and then run it again, uh, should you be so inclined. Let me make sure I made all of those executable. Okay, so now the next step would be to modify this script here to ensure that everything is set up for um, your particular network. Uh, I'm not going to change anything here, I believe, because I'm going to use the domain SNC test. Uh, 206 is this host that we're currently on. Uh, I am using a slash 24 network, so I don't need to change either of those. Um, this is the gateway of the router that this particular node is talking to. And I'm going to use 149 and 150 for my bootstrap and my master nodes. The other thing I have here, this OKD registry, this is for installing stable installs of OKD. I'll take a quick detour and show you guys that. So if you, if you go to this URL, this will give you the status of current OKD releases. Um, I'll put this in the chat for you guys. There you go. So if you go there, you, you will see the current state of uh, the given OKD releases. The very top of the list is the stable channel, right? And those are in Quay.io under OpenShift slash OKD. So if I'm going to build one of these, uh, which is what we're going to do today, I, I would build from this channel. But this will also build nightlies. So if I want to build one of the nightlies, like let's say we want to be brave uh, and build a 4.8, um, which we're not going to do today because uh, I'm not sure that I'm not going to have to make changes since 4.8 is, is giving us the ability to do the bootstrap in place. Um, you can see we're starting to get some of these that are green and stable now, so it won't be too long before we'll, we'll be um, putting out a video on how to install from that. But if I want to build from a 4.7 nightly, which I have done actually recently as I was looking to see uh, tracking particular bugs as, as we get them wiped out, um, then you can come down here to the nightlies, or um, you can even, under the stable, build older versions of 4.6 or 4.5, okay? So today we're going to build a, a stable release from, from 4.7, and it will come from Quay.io. If I did want to build a nightly, then I would change, <clears throat> excuse me, this OKD registry environment variable to registry.ci.openshift.org slash origin slash release. Okay, so that's really the only difference there. And, and I'm realizing that's probably really small font um, for you guys. So there, I'll crank that up a little bit. All right, so that's where you go to find uh, the, the current releases and um, what their disposition is. So since I'm not going to make any changes to this, I'm going to get out of that file and we'll continue on. So the next thing to do is to add this script to my bash RC so that when I log in to um, this machine, it will set that environment for me, and my single node cluster will always have the environment variables that I need it to have. And last thing, I'm just going to go ahead and from the command line, source that 
so that if I show you my in environment now, you can see that those variables in the script are now populated. And same thing, if I log out, and log back in, you can see that now because it's in my bash RC and bash is the shell I'm running, that my environment is set up and ready to go. All right, the DNS configuration. Um, I'm going to run it real quick, and then I'm going to show you uh, what it did. So the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to enable uh, name D so that it can start. And then I'm going to run. Actually, before I do that, no, I'm going to run it first, and then I'll show you what the, the magic behind the covers. So I'm going to run my setup DNS. And what it did leveraging those environment variables that set up a name server on this host that is serving the SNC test domain. I'll give you a quick view of the name d.conf. It, it's pretty much a generic um, name d.conf that it created, uh, but you can see it it's populated it with the, the snc.test zone. Um, it, it knows the, um, the reverse lookup for the pointers for this environment. And there's a file that contains my pointer records. Uh, I did create an ACL that includes um, my, uh, anything that's on this, um, 24 network, right, under my 10.11.11.0 network, and uh, my local host. Now, if you're also running uh, Podman or Docker on this, you will need to add the um, IP address for um, that network as well, so that uh, any of the containers that you run can uh, do name resolution. That has bit me before in the past uh, when I forgot to do that. Um, listening on port. 53 on both loopback and my primary NIC. And the rest of this is, is pretty much um, plain vanilla setting up name D. Created two zone files. The pointer records for my uh, SNC host, which is this guy we're sitting on right now, and then the bootstrap and the master node. And it created the A records for um, all of the hosts as well. Now, I am going to spend just a couple of minutes talking about a couple of things here. One, I'm not setting up a load balancer because this is a single node cluster, right? So I don't need to balance across different ingress nodes. I don't have infrastructure nodes. In my other tutorial, uh, you would set up um, a load balancer to manage your traffic. But here, it was complexity we didn't need. However, during the bootstrap, you have to be able to talk to either the bootstrap node or then the master node, and they have to both be able to resolve. So what I'm doing here is a little uh, DNS trick by having the same address with the two different IP addresses in there. The DNS round robin will give me a poor man's load balancer. Uh, these two records that have the remove after bootstrap uh, annotation on them will be pulled out of this when we destroy the bootstrap node leaving just the master node in place. And the, the master node has multiple records. We have the actual host for the master node. We have the Etsy D node. And then we have a wildcard for our cluster and the API um, endpoint for our cluster and the API internal. For the cluster. So all of those, you see they all resolve to the same address. They're all the master node. These are the same A records that you would create minus the duplicates for the bootstrap. 
if you were building a full cluster. And then the last one is the etcd um, serve records that are in place. So all of that was done for us by this script. Which I'll give you a quick. All right, so pretty simple. It's it's said magic in the uh, repository. I've got stub files for the name d.conf, the zone files and the name d.conf.local and those those stub files there are records in them that look like this that get substituted with some said magic uh, and when these files get put in place and then the last thing it does is refresh name d so that you get a clean start um, one word of caution don't do this on a machine that you've already configured name d because this will destroy your name d configuration Okay, so this is this is set up to to be a clean install. You're not using this particular machine for anything else except a single node cluster. Uh, then this is safe. If you're running name D, this will destroy your name D configuration. So um, be forewarned. <clears throat> All right, so name D should be set up for us. Let's make, we'll do a, a reverse uh, DNS lookup of um, this guy here. And, oh, it didn't. Oh, yes. I've got to do one other thing that is unique to my environment. Uh, I've got to, be, because I built this in this way and did not do the bridge, um, I'm going to, I need to go grab a, and do an NMCLI command to make it use this DNS because it's still trying to uh, resolve the, from the DNS of my, of my lab. got this conveniently set aside. So what I'm doing is I'm doing an NMCLI connect um, against my bridge connection and setting its name server to the environment variable that is set. This is why I use that, that set ENV in my bash RC is because then I don't have to remember numbers and things. I know that the variables are set from a consistent thing. Uh, so it's gonna put the name server and the domain in there. And if I restart now, um, my network manager, now name resolution is working. So there we got a, a reverse DNS lookup. Okay. So that's one of the big prereqs out of the way. We have DNS up and running. Now, one other thing, and, and this is for um, MacBook users. If you're doing this, and there's probably a similar way you guys can do this on, on a Windows system, on a Linux system, you, you can point your box to this DNS that you just set up. Um, but if I become um, root on my MacBook for just a moment, There's a directory called Etsy Resolver that you can put other domains in. Um, you can see I've got an entry for my home lab right now that um, any, any name address that I try to look up that ends in .clg.lab, it's going to go to this name server, 10.11.11.10 to find. Anything that is snc.test, it's going to go to this host that I'm showing you in the other tab. So this way, I from my my um, workstation, I can resolve the the cluster that I'm getting ready to set up, but I don't have to do any other fancy tricks with my local DNS. That also works if you're um, running um, 
code ready containers on your local machine as well. So um, helpful tip there. All right, the next thing is to prepare to install our cluster. And the utility scripts that I put in place are hopefully gonna make this pretty straightforward for you. All right, so first thing we're gonna do is, let me see if I can get this to go to the top. There we go, so you guys can see it. I'm gonna set uh, that OKD release variable that I was showing you guys previously. So this is the one we're gonna build from, the March, oh, no, we're not gonna do the nightly. We're gonna do the March 7th release right there, 090821. So I'm gonna set, that environment variable. And then we have to prepare our um, installation file, the manifest. And I've got a stub of that for you here as well. So you can see what's going to happen. Your base domain is going to, again, with some said magic, your base domain is going to get populated. Um, the cluster network, these defaults should work for you out of the box. If on your home network you have a 10.100 or a 172.30, uh, you might need to change either the CIDR um, for the cluster network or the service network. But um, since most people are sitting on a 10.10 .10 or a 192.168, uh, these should work for, for most of you. The compute section, you want zero replicas under the worker section. And this is what makes it a single node cluster. I'm telling it to do one master. Because we're doing a bare metal install, you, don't, you put none under the platform. Uh, since we're not doing AWS or uh, vSphere or Azure, right? If you're doing this on one of those platforms, um, then you can take advantage of their capabilities and you would put your settings here. This pull secret um, is just a fake pull secret. Uh, that is base64 encoded foobar right there. And um, this is going to get replaced with the SSH key that we created earlier. So what we're going to do, we're going to copy that into our working directory, which is down here. So now you can see I've got that install config in my uh, working directory. And then I'm going to run this said command against it to put the domain in place. Like that. Then I'm going to populate a environment variable with my SSH key that we created earlier with the public key. Don't put your private key in here. As such. And the reason I did that um, is now I'm going to set it into there. So now, if we look at what we created, let me clean this up a bit, do it again. There you go. Now we have an install config that is ready to build a single node cluster. It's a very short, very simple install config. So now I'm gonna make sure I'm in my working directory, which I am, and I'm going to install the single node cluster. Now, before I kick this off, I'm gonna go ahead and kick it off and then while the install is going, I'll pull up the code uh, and, and show you guys what is actually going on under the covers in this because I've abstracted away um, building the virtual machines and configuration and, and a whole bunch of stuff. So so I'm gonna show you guys the, the code that I wrote um, that is doing this in my own particular opinionated way. Um, before I do that, I'm going to go ahead and open up another terminal. I'm not going to make the font quite as big in this one uh, because it's just going to be for letting log scroll um, to give us some eye candy to look at. All 
I will show you there are no virtual machines installed currently. I'm going to kick this off. Oh, except I think I skipped an important step. I did. I skipped an important step. I don't have OC installed. <laughs> All right. So we'll pretend that didn't just happen. Uh, and I'm going to come over here and grab the OC command. Where we get OC from um, is, I'll show you here. Quickest way to get it when you you don't have um, anything installed on this machine yet is to go to um, the OKD repo. Here, let me crank the font up here a bit. And under the releases, Under the releases folder, you'll see all of the all of the recent releases. Okay, with each of these, um, the latest one will be the one always on top. Um, under that, you'll find downloads for the binaries. Now, it is at this stage, and I say this in the in the tutorial documentation. It is not critical that you have the latest or the, the version of OC that you're going to be installing from. It just needs to be a recent 4.x version of OC because the, the script that we run to build this is actually going to retrieve the, the real version of OC. All right, so I just pulled that from the page I just showed you guys with a wget command. Uh, I'm going to uncompress it. I'm going to move OC and kubectl to my binary directory. Uh, and then I'm gonna clean up the rest of the files. All right. So now I have an OC binary. Before I run this again, I'm going to make sure that I, my DNS configuration is still good. Yes, I can resolve Quay.io. So now we should be ready to go. All right, so no virtual machines installed. Let me make sure, okay, I didn't accidentally create any resources I need to clean up because of that. All right. So now this, where it's paused right here, this release extract, it's actually pulling the correct versions of OC and the OpenShift install. Um, it's creating all of the manifests. And now it's pulling down the Fedora Core OS uh, instances that the machines need for their initial boot. Once the bootstrapping begins, it's actually going to replace the operating system with the version of Fedora Core OS that is bundled with this version of OpenShift, so that um, everything is is controlled and managed by the OpenShift cluster itself. And that's actually one of the things I didn't mention this morning that is um, somewhat unique about OpenShift versus other Kubernetes distributions. OpenShift actually manages its own operating system that sits underneath it. All right, so now if I pop back over here, we do in fact have a couple of virtual machines. So let's watch the bootstrap. All right, so bootstrap is, is in doing its initial install of Fedora Core OS right now. Uh, sorry to interrupt. What, yep. what, what F class version did you use? Uh, I'll show. I'll show you here in a minute. It's actually embedded in the um, in the binary, or not the binary, but the script that I ran. So when I pop open the the script, uh, I'll show you there uh, because you can override that. Um, it again, it doesn't have to be 
um, the specific version of Fedora Core S that is needed for for that um, install of OpenShift. Uh, it just needs to be a, a fairly recent one. In fact, it can even be newer oh. because when the bootstrap process runs, it's going to replace the whole operating system anyway. Yeah, but that, actually, the, the March one doesn't work. Uh, it needs to be old, no, older than that. So. Yes, yes, I did not use that one. Okay, good. <laughs> All right. Now, because my script disconnected from those um, when it kicked off the initial install, they did they did not actually reboot themselves. They just shut themselves down. So, so the next thing I need to do is to boot these up. But when I do, they are going to begin the uh, single node cluster install. So I'm going to kick that off. Uh, let's see what time is it. We've it's 45 minutes in. Okay, so I'm going to go ahead and kick that off, um, and we'll let it scroll. And while it's doing its thing, um, I'll take you guys on a tour of the of the script code. All right. <clears throat> and at this point, I don't do anything else special to make the cluster install. I just start the nodes. I'm going to shorten this one so that I can come over here and let you see the console on that one when this guy starts up. So over here on the left, you'll see the bootstrap node start up. And I'll start the master node, and I'm actually going to switch... Um, and let you see the master because I want to point out something um, that it's going to be doing. All right. You see it actually didn't really do anything. Uh, you see it's pending on this uh, start job here. It is waiting to get its um, ignition config from the bootstrap node. So while that is going on... I'm going to leave that running there and get another window. All right, and in this window, I'm going to start the monitoring um, for the bootstrap. Right, still waiting for the Kubernetes API. And in this window, I'm going to let you see what's going on under the covers of that um, node. So we're gonna run a journal control against that bootstrap node. All right. this a little bit. All right, you see the RPM OS tree stuff that's going on? What it's doing here is it's downloading the correct version of Fedora Core OS that this cluster needs to run, and it's going to apply it, and there, it just finished. So you saw this guy um, kicked me out because the bootstrap is now rebooting. So I'll go ahead and pin that there. Let me separate this one out, shrink it down a bit. All right, now we're pulling a bunch of container images. Everything in here is containers. Um, we're rendering the manifests and in just a little bit, this API is going to come up and here you will see the master node um, finally get a hold of its ignition file and start its install. See there, cluster, starting cluster bootstrap, and there you go. So the master node now has its ignition, and now it is uh, booting itself up. It's going to do a very similar thing. It's going to pull uh, its uh, core OS image and apply it 
and then start its install. All right, now, if you watch these logs like this, um, don't don't panic when you see errors and things flying by. Like um, I saw it, all this failed to fetch, failed to fetch, failed to fetch. Um, this is doing a whole bunch of stuff in parallel. And so there will, it, it waits until states come into being um, so that it can do things. So during this time, you will see stuff like this. If you don't see progress down here, like you can see the API is up and running now. Um, that's where there might be an issue. Now, I'm going to stop tailing this log for just a minute because we do have to do something here. Because this is a single node cluster, we need to tell etcd that it's okay that he's all by himself and that he doesn't have two partners with him because otherwise etcd um, will get upset. So I'm going to export my cube config variable to where my install is so that I can issue OC commands. And I'm gonna see if the etcd object exists yet. Um, since I was talking to you guys, yeah, it does. If we had done this 40 seconds ago, um, you would have seen an error. I call that out in my tutorial because you do need to wait a little bit for the etcd object to, to show up. Now that it's there, we're going to patch its specification. Let me show you what we're doing here. We're going to patch its specification so that it um, will support a single node. So this is what its specification looks like right now. I'm going to apply this patch to it that is going to set this un unsupported config overrides. And now if I show that to you again, You can see now under the spec, um, there's this unsupported config overrides um, where non-HA is set to true. So that is that is one thing that in 4.8, because single node will be an officially supported configuration in 4.8, we won't have to do that anymore. Um, right now we have to do that uh, because um, it's still not a fully supported configuration, but it does work. Right, so now we're waiting for the bootstrapping to complete. While that is running, uh, I'm going to I'm going to pull up the code from that script we were looking at and show you guys what's going on in there. Let's see. You know what? That is not going to be readable. Let me just do it like this through the terminal, and that'll be more readable for you. All right, so what this is going to do is um, set up the infrastructure for you. Um, you can see here I'm setting some variables that you can override. Um, I'm setting the CPUs for the cluster to be four. I'm setting the memory to 16 gigabytes. I'm setting the disk size that it creates to 200 gigabytes. My Fedora Core OS version that I'm going to do my initial boot from is this one right here. That was, that was your question previously, Bruce. And I'm pulling from the stable stream of Fedora Core OS. So you can, you can experiment with, with different versions of Fedora Core OS and, and using the testing stream or the, you know, the what's next stream if, if you want to. Um, this will also take um, some flags for CPU memory and disk as well. All right, there are several functions that I've defined that I'm going to skip past and come back to. Um, 
the actual start of the script. So one thing I'm doing, I'm this is a this is a cheesy little random generator here. So I apologize to everybody up front, but I'm generating MAC addresses for my bootstrap and my master node. So I'm generating those MAC addresses. And, and the reason I'm doing that, it really has nothing to do with OpenShift. It's the way that I wanted to automate the creation of these virtual machines. And I wanted to give them um, fixed IP addresses. So use, knowing what the MAC address is uh, enables me to have predictable names for the devices. And I'll show you that in a minute because that's something that I also do in my larger clusters for my home lab. Uh, because I'm simulating in my home lab running bare metal clusters. So, so then I use, a, um, I use a dig to get the IP addresses that are already um, in DNS for the bootstrap and the master node, and I populate variables with those. Here's where I'm pulling the um, OKD tooling for the OpenShift installer and for the OC command, and I'm putting those into my uh, home bin directory and then uh, getting rid of that, that um, temporary folder that I created. Here, I'm grabbing a tool called FCCT. This is a Fedora Core OS tool that allows you to um, manipulate ignition files for machines. And I'll show you the configuration um, further up in this script for what I'm, what I'm using FCCT for. That enables you, especially if you're doing bare metal cluster work, that enables you to um, configure what the operating system is going to look like. Let's say you're deploying some nodes and you want um, you know, SSD devices that are in them to be preserved for Rook Ceph. This is a, a mechanism that you could do that. And you want to specify what your um, file system configurations or other resource utilizations or GPUs or things like that. Uh, this is a good way that you can you you can inject things into the ignition. So then, um, this is just good old fashioned um, OpenShift doing its thing, creating the manifests. I'm creating the ignition configs. Here, I'm calling one of my functions, um, config OKD node, that I'll pop up to the top of the script and show you guys. And what it's doing is using that FCCT command to then create the custom ignition files for these machines. And then I'm putting those in the um, directory of my Nginx server. So that's what this, that's what's going on here with this copy and this schmod. I'm um, putting those files over there so that they can be retrieved at the very first boot of that machine before it starts building the cluster. The next things here from this um, Sys Linux on down, I'm actually preparing an ISO um, for this machine to boot from. Again, because I didn't want to create a Pixie environment. I, I, I'm not using vSphere, I'm, this is all bare metal. So I'm creating an ISO for the, um, the bootstrap node and for the master node that have the specific configuration in them that they need just to come up and then start uh, being part of the cluster. And the last thing here after creating those, those ISOs is then <clears throat> to create the virtual machines themselves. And um, the creation of the virtual machines themselves is uh, using the vert install and passing the appropriate parameters, including the particular ISO file that I just created. All right, so the last thing I'm gonna show you in here, uh, let's check on our, our bootstrap. Bootstrap is still running to make sure Nothing's blown up over here. Everything appears to be healthy. Okay. So this function, config OKD node, um, what, what the FCCT tool works with is YAML files, an ignition config. And I'm setting this up as a merge type. So it's going to merge 
the the following configuration into the ignition config that then becomes the initial ignition config for this machine to boot off of. This is why I had to know the MAC address because I am explicitly hard coding the name of that NIC to be NIC zero so that it's always predictable. And then I'm configuring network manager with the um, network information about that machine. It's IP address, uh, the net, net mask for the network that it's on, it's gateway, the name server and the domain. And finally, populating its host name. So it, it's fairly short, but it gives you a, a clue into the power of uh, ignition configs and what you can do with them. So I am prescriptively setting up the network configuration for this guy before he boots up. And that's the deploy OKD SNC script. It does all of that for you. And looks like the bootstrap is now done. If we come down here, there we go. Our bootstrap is complete. So the next step here, because our bootstrap um, is completed, is to get the bootstrap node out of the way. All right? And that one is a very, very simple script. It um, uses verse commands to remove the, the node, um, to shut it down hard, undefine it, remove its pool, and then destroy the files under slash virtual machines. I'm um, also, remember those DNS files that had the little remove after bootstrap tag? Um, I'm using a cheesy little grep stunt here to yank those out of my DNS configuration and then restarting name D so that um, everything is cleaned up. So now at this point, we can watch the rest of the installation complete. Oh, I did not want to start Apple Music. Sometimes this thing is annoying. So that was watching for the bootstrap complete. There's another command that is very similar and also in the tutorial for watching the rest of the install. All right, and this will take a little bit while it completes everything. There are now a couple more things that we need to do because this is a single node cluster. First, let's just look and see how everything is looking here. All right, running, running, completed. Running and completed are good. Crash, back off is not good, but I don't see any of those. So everything appears to be fat and happy right now. So a couple of things that we need that we need to do. The um, ingress operator is going to be unhappy because it expects to have two replicas and the authentication operator is also going to be unhappy because it is expecting three Etsy D nodes. So we have to tell those two um, that we're running in a single node configuration. So let me first, let's look at the ingress operator. Let's get the ingress controller named default in the OpenShift ingress operator namespace. Let's see, make sure it exists. Yep, it does. Let's take a quick look at it. Oh, oh I probably did that while the API server was in the middle of um, doing its thing. That will happen occasionally, the because while it's um, while it's working toward completion, it, it will stop and start a couple of 
uh, of things. So don't be alarmed if you temporarily lose access to your cluster. If it doesn't come back, then um, we'll be worried, but it should come back here shortly. Just do a quick look, make sure we're still running. Yep. I'm hoping it comes back sooner than that. This is a bit of a longer pause that I'm used to normally seeing. at our master node. So this is a good opportunity to show you. Um, with that key that we created, um, we can SSH in as the core user to one of our nodes. This is actually a little bit worrisome. I hope my node didn't freeze. Of course, this, this ran perfectly smoothly three times this morning. Um, we're still waiting on that. Right. Our node is still up and responding, so let's just hope this is a little burp and that we didn't have some kind of a weird lock going on. Oh, there we go. Now that didn't let me in. A little bit disturbed that that one did not. Let's make sure. see anything super disturbing there. sure it didn't inadvertently remove the wrong entry. Nope, my API is still 150, 150, 150. All right, so this is an unhappy node. I'm going to do something. Um, I'm going to reboot it and see if etcd will recover after it reboots because it is not responding on port. Actually, before I do that, let's see what it is listening on. Nope, port 6443 is not there. FCD is not healthy. Let's let it reboot. And while we're doing that, I'll come over here. Hey, Bruce, any questions or, or anything in the um, in the chat? Well, 
our single node cluster is unhealthy and yeah unhealthy. Now, eric had a question earlier what happens if you execute your script with minus h i guess he's asking if there's a help function oh there is not <laughs> um these are not production ready scripts <laughs> If you execute it with a, a dash Tell, eight, tells you the appropriate um, sacrifice to make for the demo. Yes, un, un, unpredictable behavior. Let's see. All right, let's see if this guy is um, he's rebooting. Okay. He's Back up. All right. Okay, so further to that, he said that he tried minus H yeah. and didn't get any VMs to come up. Oh, okay. All right, it looks like something happened to etcd during this install. So what I'm going to do now is show you guys how, how to tear this whole thing down and do it again. Because it looks like etcd is not going to start for us. Watch this for just a couple of minutes. Nothing is standing out when we grab the logs. Um, probably be able to find something. So here we go. This is what it looks like when it goes wrong. Oh, wait a minute. Nope. Nope, it is not. Okay, so what I'm going to do um, is tear this sucker down and show you what it looks like um, to tear it up so you can run it again. So one note, the you know the bootstrap machine is gone because we already destroyed it. So the only machine running right now is that master node. So there's a there's another helper script um, undeploy the node that will tear that out now. So now it's completely gone. Um, the DNS let me show you. So the DNS entries, the bootstrap entries are not there. So I need those to be in place um, before I can start this again. So to run the install again, I run my setup DNS script. And you can see it put my bootstrap entries back. And then I run my deploy again. Uh, I need to make sure I'm in the screen that had the OpenShift version set. Um, so I'll just go ahead and re-export that. Get some of these extra screens out of the way here. That one was completely hung on that bad SSH. So something went bad with that node. So 
So we're going to do this again. We're going to use this release, March 7. We'll start our deploy again. And I will say, um, in my in my larger lab environment, I actually have an Nginx server set up um, that I have a mirror of these image repositories in. And that allows me um, to have much, much faster installs because it's not having to reach all the way across um, to Quay.io to, to get the um, container images. Um, it already has them locally. And that helps if, if you're experimenting or building and tearing down a lot of clusters or something goes wrong um, like it did today. Okay, so Tara, we got a couple of interesting discussions in the chat that you. Uh, so yeah. Michael, Michael was asking right. about uh, any thoughts uh, regarding the network bridge part uh, if you're doing it on a remote machine where you don't have keyboard access. Okay, and uh, now what what you've generally done is start out with keyboard yes. access to get something installed, right? Correct. Well. I in in the tutorial that's what i suggest in my home lab um, i actually have a pixie set up um, and while here let me let me kick this off again and then we'll we'll wander over and i'll, I'll show you how i do that in my home lab all right still waiting for the master to finish there we go okay they're both done Let me let me set this to um, monitor install because I do need to. I'm gonna I'm gonna move these um, out of the way so that I can set that Etsy D patch um, quickly once this bootstrap completes. And you know, I will say that that weird um, the the cluster couldn't finish thing. I have seen that a couple of times in my lab, and I'm wondering if it's a race condition on um, when I yank the bootstrap node out that etcd goes sideways somehow. Because I, I have it's very rare that I've seen this, and of course it would happen on the day that we're we're doing a video. Um, but I have actually seen that happen with a full cluster build uh, a couple of times, but not enough times uh, to warrant actually getting in to see if I can figure out why it's doing that. But you're, you're also using the uh, OpenShift SDN network. Uh, I've had problems with that in the past. Cor Correct. You're right. I'm not using the, um, the Kubernetes OVN network. Although that actually shouldn't, that shouldn't have had any impact on Etsy D. That, wh what was weird is that Etsy D itself actually fell over and, and 
wasn't able to recover and it happened shortly after we yanked the the bootstrap node out all right uh let me show you what were we talking about oh yeah um pixie boot All right, so in my environment, um, I should probably be using Ansible for some of this, but I know Shell, so I write Shell. So in my environment, when I, when I get a new Nook and I'm adding it to my lab, um, I have a, a utility script here, deploy KVM host. Uh, that all I have to give it is the host name that that new Nook is going to have, the MAC address off the butt of that Nook, so I flip it over on its butt and I get the MAC address off of it, and how many disks it has in it, because some of the Nooks just have a single M2 slot and some of the Nooks have two M2 slots. So what this script does is... It, let me, let me come down past the function. Um, so it creates a little working directory for um, some iPixie. It does a dig, just like you saw in the, in the single node cluster one to get the IP address that I've already pre-populated in DNS. Um, creates a file uh, that is named the MAC address with the colons replaced with dashes and a dot ipixie and creates an ipixie um, file for that machine so that it will boot from this kernel and this initial RAM disk off of my Nginx server and uh, it pre-populates the IP information that I want this machine to have. Let me pause for a minute, make sure our, okay, our API is up. So I need to pause real quick and I need to patch um, etcd. Okay, there we go. Let me tell etcd it's okay to be a single node cluster. All right, okay. So now bootstrapping is still running. Okay, and then I create a a uh, kickstart file for that machine and the the kickstart file then has all of the configuration um, that I want it to have uh, and here's where I feed in the disk information um, it, it's going to create some of the file systems with um, prescriptive sizes and then just uh, blow the rest of them out to whatever the the size of the disk is uh, it sets up the network configuration with the host name and the bridge devices. And I think this is this is what you were asking, Mike. Um, so so by doing it this way, in fact, most of the nooks up in my lab, um, I'm embarrassed to say I've got 16 of them. The nooks in my lab, um, most of them have never had a monitor plugged into them. The ones that have had a monitor plugged into them, it was probably so that I could um, update the firmware because every so often you need to update the firmware. Um, hey, Neil, I just saw. Um, so there is a hackified way to do upgrades of a single node cluster, um, but it doesn't always work. Now with, with, um, with, with 4.8, you will be able to up, upgrade a single node cluster and it will be more of a supported configuration for updating single node clusters. Uh, but it still obviously requires that the whole cluster goes down. So like we're with a, you know, with a full HA three node plus workers cluster, um, you can do upgrades without any downtime. With a single node cluster, you incur downtime when you do an upgrade. Yeah, so I'm using Kickstart in my lab and it's it sets up everything that I want this machine um, 
to be doing. So since this is a KVM host, uh, it's, you know, it's installing the libvirt um, tooling that I need. And then it reboots the machine. And when the machine comes up, it's got its full personality and it's ready to be part of my lab. And I think I've got a, a section in my tutorial, yeah, for setting up um, the Pixie Boot. Uh, so there's a section in here. Uh, it also talks about the little router that I'm using. Yeah, hey, Charles. All right, so let's see how our boot uh, yeah, doing. Yeah, Patrick also had a question about uh, trying this on a Mac. And I told him that uh, I wasn't courageous enough myself, but... Uh, you're braver than I am. I have not tried. I have not tried this on on my Mac. Um, actually, code ready containers will will run on your Mac. Um, and once we once we're waiting on a, a a bug fix for the bare metal installer that actually the Dean will probably drop the new release today. Um, and if that's working, then I'm going to build the 4.7 version of Code Ready Containers for OKD. Uh, the version that's currently out there is still 4.6. Um, but actually, coming up soon, because um, we're having to work on support for um, Apple um, Silicon, uh, you will be able to build um, Code Ready Containers on your MacBook. And once we do that, you can actually use that to build a single node cluster on your MacBook, if you were so inclined. You'd probably need one of the MacBooks with 32 gig of RAM. I don't know that it would work on 16. Um, once we're at 4.8 and you don't need the bootstrap node anymore, then uh, it, it's probably more likely to work. All right, let's see how our cluster's doing here. All right. Things are creating. It's okay. There, there will be errors. Um, if you look at this before bootstrapping is complete, you will see um, containers in error states. Uh, again, just like when we were watching the log scroll, most of the time that is okay. It just means that there's some collaborator resource that this particular operator is waiting on that isn't there yet. And so it continues to error until its collaborator is in place and then it will, it will finish its installation. Are there any other questions? I'm hoping that this time we'll actually get to see a, a completed install and that etcd doesn't go sideways on us again. Let's take a quick look at the bootstrap node and see what's going on inside of it. All right, things are progressing. So that's all looking good. And one thing, once once you get this up, there are some of the operators from the marketplace that might be assuming a, a fuller cluster. Um, I know like Rook, Seth, um, out of the box, um, you if you want to run Rook, Seth on a, on a single node, uh, you'll have to adjust the replica count for some of the components because it will expect, you know, at least three nodes for particular things. Um, code ready containers, yes and no. 
Patrick. Um, the code ready containers doesn't configure the nodes in exactly the same way that this does. But while we're waiting, um, while we're waiting for the bootstrapping to complete, which actually this it might be getting ready. Let's watch here. I'll come to that in just a minute, and I'll show you guys um, how Code Ready Containers is built. I'm thinking this is the end of the bootstrap process here. Yes. All right. So we successfully bootstrapped again. clusters Let's see if we're going to get past it this time. Hopefully it will it will set that cert. There we go. Okay. We made it out of the woods that time. Excellent. Let me do a quick check and make sure that all of our certificate signing requests got approved and issued. Okay. That's good. That's good. All right. Progress this time. Okay. Um, single node cluster from code ready containers. It it's actually doing it, it is useful um, to give you some insights into something. It's it's actually doing an IPI libvirt install of your OpenShift cluster, um, which is um, is pretty cool in and of itself. Uh, in, in a similar fashion to what I'm doing here. In fact, let me see. I was hacking on Code Ready containers. Let me go find it here. Yeah, there we 
we go. So there's a, a, a project, um, SNC and CRC are the two projects um, that it's get it's built from. Let me go ahead and, okay, it's up to date. All right. All right. Crank the font up for you guys. Apologies that that makes the screen really crowded. So what um, the punchline in this, it, it is um, very prescriptive toward building code ready containers. So it strips a bunch of things out of the OpenShift cluster, like monitoring and, and things like that to make it fit. Um, in a really uh, compact size or compact for OpenShift. Um, let me find the installer. So it is, um, it's writing into the manifests uh, the domain information and the, the VM name that it's creating. And then it's using... Um, find where it's calling the OpenShift install. We're still manipulating the manifest, still manipulating manifests. Okay, created the ignition files. Um, somewhere in here, right here. After creating the ignition configs, it is, um, using the bare metal to then um uh, it's right in here some oh, here we go creating the cluster so this is using the i it's using an ipi install where the um installer actually does all of the provisioning and, and stuff for you um so not you know not giving you control over the network configuration or things like that this is more like the i'm deploying in the cloud on aws or on gcp or or on on vmware or you know something along those lines so that's what that's what the code ready containers is built from so this big long snc.sh script here what it's actually doing is standing up a single node cluster uh on libvirt and then um, you run another script uh, that's part of this bundle called, um, uh, where's it at? Create disk, where's create disk? Um, right there, called create disk, that then um, creates a QCOWS image of the, the cluster. It strips a whole bunch of operators out to, you know, like I said, to try to get the size down as much as possible. And once it's, once it's done all of that, it does a, a couple of little tweaks to the running virtual machine so that it's compatible with Hyper-V for running on Windows or some other things. And then at the very end here, uh, it um, creates, where it's doing this um, create tarball for Hyper-V, for Hyper-Kit, and for libvirt so so for each of these there's functions further up here you see it it's creating the q mu image um it creates then from this images for windows for linux and for mac os right and that's ba and and when you're done with that then you have a a file a, a virtual machine file that is a single node cluster that would run on one of those platforms code ready containers is then a wrapper around that that bundles the the image um so that you can start and stop it with the crc and that's why the crc binary is so fat if you go download it you'll see that like the the mac os crc binary is um like two and a quarter gigabytes i think um, most of that is the virtual machine image because it's a uh, when it uncompresses, it uncompresses to about a um, nine, ten gigabyte image. So most of that two and a quarter gigabyte CRC binary is your compressed disk image um, that contains the the cluster. 
Okay, now there's a couple of things. Oh, how did Chrome start? There's a couple of things we need to do now um, so that our cluster um, can complete starting. Because, like I was telling you before our previous one went south, authentication is going to be upset and the um, uh, ingress controller is going to be upset. Because it's not going to be able to start all of the um, replicas that it wants to start. So let's see if we can successfully do that this time without our cluster going sideways on us. This is where we were before it went sideways. Ingress controller should be named default. Actually, let's just do it this way. I'll show you that it's named default. Well, it's going to be in the OpenShift ingress operator namespace. There it is. His name is default. So let's take a look at good old default. And scrolling, scrolling, scrolling. You see, it wants to have two replicas. All right, well, we don't have two nodes for it to have replicas on uh, because if we were able to dig further into its configuration that is not shown to us here uh, it also has um, anti-affinity policies in place so that it won't run two of its pods on the same um, node and so because it has that anti-affinity in place one of its pods is is not going to be able to start and since it wants to and it can't have to then the operator won't be healthy so what we're going to do is a good old-fashioned patch command actually you could do it you could do it the the boring way like this OC edit, and I could go down here and change that replicas to one and save it. But if you really want to impress your friends, uh, the OC patch command looks like magic. Because from the command line without doing anything else, and this is also how you, how you can do this kind of thing with infrastructure as code. So what I'm going to do, this is a JSON patch. Um, and what I'm saying is under the under spec, I want replicas to be one and I'm doing a patch type of merge rather than replace. I'm going to, I'm going to merge this into the existing config and, and I'm going to patch the ingress controller named default in the OpenShift ingress operator namespace with that patch. And there it is. Now it's patched. And if I do this dash O YAML again and scrolling, scrolling up, you can see that now replicas is one. Okay, well, there's there's one other that we need to do this with, and that is the um, authentications operator, and it needs a patch similar to what we did to Etsy D. So I need to tell it that it's going to have an unsupported configuration override of use unsupported, unsafe, non-HA, non-production, unstable OAuth server to treat. Uh, and you can tell that, that the engineers that put this in here wanted you to know that you were intentionally using unsupported, unsafe, non-HA, non-production, unstable OAuth server, just in case you weren't quite sure. And there we are. So now we said, I want to use the unsupported, unsafe, non-HA, non-production, unstable OAuth server. And 
hopefully now that I've done that, this message down here, you see we're 98%, we're almost there. Um, hopefully now we'll get past that because now the authentication operator should be able to um, complete its uh, install and update. And we actually don't have to wait for that. Um, the secret here is we already have a we, we already have a usable cluster at this point. Um, so let's go ahead and go get um, the. Go ahead and go get the authentication. Okay, you see this OKD4 installed there? That was created um, by my script, and that's where it put the manifests and things, and then told the installer where to go to get its manifests. Um, so that's all of this stuff under here was created by the installer. So, so there's the there's the ignitions that were created. Ah, and you see this guy right here, the worker ignition. Um, oh, yeah, look at that. There it is. We have a working cluster. So we'll prove it now by logging into it from the console. Um, before I step away from this though, you see this worker ignition? Um, if you were in the main stage um, when we were first starting and we were talking about you know, the fact that you can't go from a single node cluster um, to a full cluster, that's really just talking about the control plane. We could use this ignition file, this worker ignition file. Um, I could build a, a virtual machine boot that virtual machine off of this worker ignition file and it would join the cluster as a worker. I, I would not have an HA Etsy D control plane because I would be using an unsupported, unsafe, non-HA, non-production, unstable Etsy D. But I can create lots of worker nodes now and, and have a single master uh, cluster with, with worker nodes. So. Since our cluster is up, let's go ahead and log into it. You'll notice down here, it, it gave me a URL uh, and it gave me a username and a password. Um, if you lose those, you can get them back. Uh, what I was going to show you is under this auth directory here. Um, this cube config is what I've been using when you've seen me um, do this. That cube config is kind of like the you know passwordless SSH, um, so it gives me immediate access to it. That's like my backdoor key. Don't share that unless you want to give people cluster admin access to your cluster. Um, and if you delete it, you can't get it back. Uh, but it's probably a good idea to either keep it in a super secret safe place or delete it uh, and use the, the identity management that's there. The other thing that it gives you um, is this cube admin password, which uh, is a file that contains this randomly generated string right there that is the password. So let's get a Safari window. And the URL to our new cluster. Okay, it's using um, self-signed certs, right? Because I didn't, I had a very, very simple um, install config, so I didn't give it any certs to use. So it's using self-signed certs. So I do need to um, accept the certs, uh, and it's going to make me do this twice. All right, now we're gonna log in as cube admin and we need our password. And there we are folks. We have a OpenShift single node cluster. Now, one thing to point out here, you see this, um, this two right here uh, in, a, in a fully functional cluster. What that number off to the side of the pods shows you is pods that are in some sort of a not ready state. Um, let me show you in one of my um, larger lab clusters. You see that's not there because all of the pods are, are in a good state. You will always see this in the 4.7 um, OpenShift cluster because there are two etcd quorum guard pods uh, that don't have anywhere to run. So 
nothing to worry about here. It's not broken. Um, it, it's just you, you will see that because these two etcd quorum uh, guard pods don't have a node to run on. Um, when we get the full um, bootstrapless 4.8, um, you shouldn't see that anymore. But at this point now, the cluster is ready to run. Uh, there's actually a couple of other things that I included in the tutorial um, that will be helpful for you. One of them is, let's go ahead and set up um, a, a real user account and a developer user account. All right, and and I did include in the in the tutorial. And let me get back to let me get back to that. So in this in this space, um, you see this HT password cr.yaml this is a, a custom resource that i created for you so that you can set up um hd password authentication within the cluster itself and what we're going to do right now is let's create i'm just going to pull these straight out of the out of the tutorial. So I'm going to create a working directory for the credentials. And locally on my box, I'm going to, this was actually when you saw initially we were installing the HTT tools. Um, that was to get to the HT password command so that I can create HT password files. So I'm going to create an HT password file called HT password in that directory I just created and for a user admin and i'm going to make its password um the the password that was auto gen right if you don't want to do that um you just put whatever you want your password to be right here all right and while i'm at it let's go ahead and um create just a regular developer user too and we'll add it to the same password and his password will be dev password and now from that ht password file i'm going to create a secret in the openshift config namespace um, it's a generic secret i'm going to name it ht password secret and i'm going to create the secret from the file and it's going to name the file ht password and i'm giving it the path to that file so this from file equals equals is kind of weird the first equals is what you want the file in the secret to be named and the second equals is what the physical file that you're creating the secret file from is called so i'm going to create that secret so now um, come back over here See, in our single node cluster, we should have a secret now that was created called HT password. You know, I always forget there's a, there's a search here. Right there it is. So there's the secret we just created in the OpenShift config namespace. And it has that the content of that HD password that we just created. All right, so that's step one. Now it's in the OpenShift config. Step two is to apply that custom resource right there, the HD password custom resource. And it will do this because I'm using an OC apply and not an OC create. I just, I'm in a habit of always using OC apply. Um, so this is just it complaining, but it didn't actually break anything. So now if I, um, let's see. Uh, what's the type? Let me see what, I forget what the type is from this custom resource. Oh, it's a type of. There. 
I've got an OAuth named cluster. You see, um, there it is. There's my identity provider. It's a type of HT password, and it's um, using the HT password secret to get its data. So now we have some real authentication so I can get out of this kub admin user. And now you see I've got two options here for logging in. I can log in with the kub admin, which was the, the one that was created temporarily, or I can log in now with my new um, provider. So I'm gonna log in as admin. And there, I just logged in. Um, need to do one other thing though, because I'm not admin. I'm a, I'm just a developer with, with self-provisioner, right? Okay, so I need to give my admin user authority. So I'm gonna give my admin user cluster admin right by adding the uh, cluster role of cluster admin policy to that user. And there you go, you saw in the background, boom, now it knows who I am. Now it knows that I'm the administrator of this system. And if I log in as my dev user, oh, Now I have an admin and a developer user. So the last thing I'm gonna do is, I don't like this temporary account. Uh, I don't like leaving credentials lying around that were in plain text. So the last thing I'm going to do is get rid of that kub admin user. And I do that just by deleting that kub admin secret from the namespace kub system. Now don't do this until you have another way to administer um, your system, um, especially if you've also deleted the um, that this right here, if you've deleted that kube config, because um, at that point you've locked yourself out of your cluster and your only uh, option, is, your only recourse is reinstall. But now if I refresh this there, I don't have to select my identity provider now. I can just log in as admin and in secure password. Oh, oops, I didn't I didn't go back to the um, console. And get back to the console URL. I did that from now what is now an illegitimate URL. There we go. So we now have two users, a dev user and a cluster admin. A um, couple of other things just to keep it from complaining at you. If you're going to use the internal uh, image registry, um, you either need to give it a host volume or an ephemeral volume. Uh, in the tutorial, I've got um, the command for you to give it a uh, ephemeral volume. So I'm going to switch the image registry to a managed state, and I'm going to give it an empty dir, which is an ephemeral um, volume. But since you only have one node, um, that ephemeral volume is really sitting on the file system of that one node. So the images that you put there, that they're living on that one node. So you can use the internal image registry at this point now. Uh, and you saw in the background there, it's actually um, doing some things. Because of that, you see the image registry um, kicked up. So now we've got the image registry running. And that one is shutting down and replaced itself. So now we've got a configured image registry. 
And the last thing is uh, image pruners. It, it will complain if you don't have an image pruner scheduled, you'll get warnings in your um, console. So let's just go ahead and set up an image pruner that will um, prune out images based on this configuration at midnight. And there we go. What time is it? We've got an hour left in our official time. Um, if I haven't run everybody off, are there any other questions or anything else that you guys want to talk about? Anything else, Bruce, in the chat? Pretty congratulatory. So, uh, you know, both on the uh, second time around, I guess it's always turn it off and turn it on again uh, is, the, is the remedy. Yeah, I know. I, you know... I I need to run enough installs. I might kick off a, a loop that just spins them and shuts them down to, to see if I can catch what it is that causes Etsy D to fall over. Cause like I said, I've, I've seen that just a few times and I literally ran this at least three times this morning and four or five times yesterday while I was cleaning. Yeah. I don't usually yank the bootstrap that fast, but of course the one that we're recording is the one that, that goes, and that's that's probably when it happens. I, I might experiment with that and see if there's a race condition in yanking the bootstrap node after it tells you it's okay. Maybe you need to hold your breath and count to 10 and then yank the bootstrap and, node and, out. Uh, uh, I've also seen it become unstable if you wait too long. Yeah. I, I had a question for you too because um, like I, I was in a situation once where – uh the authentication was no longer working because of a failed upgrade and the only way i could get into the system at all to debug it was with the cube admin uh, and there is sort of no way of getting yeah. it back once you delete it see it that that's right so what i've generally done i i've i have found that ht password um it's pretty stable, even across upgrades. Um, at a previous place where, where I was doing this for real in the data center, um, what I set up for them, be, because they, they had um, Azure AD as their um, authentication mechanism. So, but, but if something went either wrong with that or with the cluster's integration to Azure AD, that they would lose access to their cluster. So we set up HT password for just a few of the cluster admins. And that was kind of the always their back door. And then you just set up a, you know, a password rotation and complexity policy that periodically replaces that secret. And, and that way you, you've at least got a way to get into your cluster if you, you lose your primary yeah. OAuth provider. I've also right. set it up. Yeah, no, I usually use uh, actually GitLab off. But uh, Michael has a question here. Did you see that, uh, Charo? Yes. Yes. And, and Mike, you're absolutely right. In fact, you can do that with code ready containers too. That's the way to make code ready containers available off the workstation that you're running it on is to slap HA proxy or your favorite um, um, proxy in front of it and and use that to route the traffic um in this in this case uh i'm using the etsy the etsy resolver on my macbook um to get to it in my bastion host that is balancing traffic across the three uh control and the three control plane nodes are also my infrastructure nodes. So they're also running ingress and the image registry and, and other things. Anything else, guys? Uh, well, Charo, have you, uh, one of the things I noticed in uh, basically all of the various tutorials is that uh, 
uh, everybody's using self-signed certificates. And I think that with, because you need a wildcard certificate, uh, the, the only free ones that you'll get is if you have a uh, real domain name. So yeah. You have to spend, so you have to spend 20 bucks for a domain name, which isn't that excessive these days. Yeah, which I, I did. I bought a domain name um, because I plan on actually one of these days. Um, my, my wife is encouraging me to do this and I just never get around to it. Um, is to start right is to start keeping an official blog of this stuff so i did buy a domain um upstream without a paddle um, <laughs> there's nothing there right now if you go to it but that's me um upstream without a paddle so i actually do um to to create some real certs and do this um with with real certs so that i can i can show folks how that works as well. Um, I'll get around to it one of these days. One of the other things that I, I'm not sure if I, I would have to make any endpoints available on the internet to make that work, but but that's another thing I don't do is um, make any of the endpoints available on the internet. In fact, I actually run my lab as though it was a disconnected data center. So I've got firewalls uh, and routers, right. actually two layers of firewall between my cluster and and the internet um and and i've got a maven mirror um sitting in nexus uh, i actually in the big tutorial there's a section where i'll lead you through doing a disconnected install of openshift using nexus and you and you actually put quay.io and the red hat um, domains in a dns sinkhole to simulate um being firewalled off Things that, that I also would like to do is to set up a certificate signing service in the lab so that you're, you've got your own um, certificate authority that you use to sign the certs. And it's kind of a in-between um, where you don't have fully signed certs from, you know, like a VeriSign or, or what's, the, what's the free service um, that I always forget the name of, um, but you're doing your own certificate management and there's a there actually is a cert manager operator um, I actually have it installed in here because it was needed for either key cloak or maybe it was Skyla DB I forget um, why I installed it but I've got the um, certificate manager operator installed in my cluster to do internal um, cert management. Hey, um, Neil, Neil had asked a question. Does it work in single node? Hey, Neil, if if you're still here, I think he was talking about the operator, wasn't? Weren't you, Neil? Oh, the you know, I don't know. I haven't I haven't tried installing it in a single node cluster yet. It'd be worth. Oh, let's let's see. Is it in? Is it an operator hub? Let's find out. This is the single node cluster, right? Yeah, we're on the single node cluster. Let's go to the operator hub. Um, oh, cert manager is not in the operator hub. I installed it via the um, from the GitHub repo. Let's install an operator. Here we go. So this is the operator hub, everybody. If you haven't seen it, we're going to install the Strimzy Kafka operator. Stable, all namespaces, and automatic approval. We'll see if this is one that is not single node friendly.
So far, so good. Neil, that's what that's why I did it. Oh, so there we go. We just installed the Kafka operator cluster. It is health and it is now ready for us to create a single node Kafka cluster.